Yes, technically I get paid to get you to this point in time, but I don't want to just lead you to a yes. I want to help you live yeah. the life that you're saying yes to. Welcome back to the Daily Coach YouTube channel. I have a longtime friend, Mr. Eric Wexler, joining me today. Eric, welcome to Kim Daily TV. Thank you, Kim. Pleasure to be here. I'm so happy to have you here. It's so fun to bring friends into my yeah. channel. So, Eric, you know, the, the Daily Coach is all about sharing the good news in franchising. And today, our conversation just about sharing some of your experiences highlights in your career. I mean, you've been in franchise development for a long, long time. No doubt you've seen it, heard it all. <laughs> we just want to pick your brain a little bit and share some of that knowledge that you have in there with both candidates who may be considering exploring a franchise. Why should I get into a franchise? And then also maybe franchisors. There might be some um, insight that you have that would help a franchisor become a better franchisor. So that's where our conversation is going Great. to go. But what I want to start today, Eric, is people like to do business with people they know, like, and trust. Indeed. So I would like you to tell the Daily Coach followers <laughs> one fun fact about Mr. Eric Wexler oh. that will help my audience to feel like they know you a little bit. All thing. right. All right. Fun fact. That's a lot of pressure. I mean, there's so much fun about me. I think I just exude fun. One fun fact. It's true well, thing. I, I don't know if this is so much one fun fact, but, but this is something that I think is very important. This is something that, that I, I tell my kids um, regularly or remind them of regularly, and that is... To be interesting to people, you need to be interested in people. And, and I truly am interested in people. I think you know that from the time that we've spent together. Um, I, I really am. I'm, I'm genuinely interested in, 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 in somebody personally and, and professionally in all aspects of them. Um, myself, when, when, when the conversation comes around to, to me, and uh, it, it's almost always about family and friends. I have, I have such a deep, really passionate love for my family and my friends. And I consider my friends, so many of them family as well. Um, I have three kids and they're fantastic. I just, I, I couldn't be more proud of them. Uh, one of whom, my, my middle child uh, has autism. That's, uh, that's a special thing in my life. And, and people that have any experience or exposure to that can relate to that very, very um, well. And, and not to say that I put that out there so that people can relate, but it really is a, a huge core for who I am. Friends, family, and I'm interested in, in people genuinely. And I can second all of that. Reardon has been a part of our conversation since probably the first time I ever met you. I don't even know how Do many you want years me to say how many years? Yeah. It is very special. I think it's been almost. I don't know. How many years is it? Do you uh, know? Yeah, almost 20. Almost 20 years, Kim. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> We've been together since the very yeah. beginning. <laughs> yeah. But the high school. Since we were right. like 14, then, right, Eric? Since we exactly. <laughs> Exactly, because we we're, we were child prodigies. <laughs> and you haven't aged a day. All right, awesome. Well, so, you know, you've represented multiple franchises along the path. I guess let's just kind of, before we get into your expertise in, you know, development and success and failure in franchising, tell the audience a little bit about how you got into franchising and um, why you stayed then for 20 years, if it has been that many years. Oh, uh, yeah, it has been. And uh, and I don't ever intend to leave the industry of franchising. It's It's so wonderful. I got into it, Kim. I was introduced to a mutual friend of ours, actually. Um, a colleague of yours, a longtime colleague of yours, and I are friends truly back from our teenage years from the 80s. And um, Mark Hale and I are childhood friends. Yeah, our parents were friends. And, and we met. Mark yeah, Linda. absolutely. And, and I've known Linda and Mark since 1987. In any case, uh, um, I had a, a business plan. I was, I was out of college. I got into the restaurant world, as my mother said, before I, I found myself and got a real job. But I spent 10 years running restaurants at a pretty high managerial level. And that's where I was first exposed and excited about uh, business ownership, what it takes to achieve. But, um, I desired to be a business owner myself. And so I had a business plan that I put together, which had to do with direct mail, not franchising. I really didn't know much about franchising, more than, than the typical person considers fast food and stuff like that. 
Um, but I was discussing the business plan with Mark Kale. And he introduced me to a franchisor mostly for two reasons. One, because they were local to me in Maryland. And two, because they had a direct mail program. And my business plan had to do with direct mail. And so I was introduced to a company called The Cleaning Authority. And this was 20 years ago. And um, rather than really continuing down the path of considering is there a synergy where we can work together, my business plan and, and, and their resources, I became passionate about franchising as I learned about their business model. It wasn't out about residential cleaning. That's not what made me passionate, but about the, uh, the, the balance of, of ever evolving systems with the passion and drive and execution of an entrepreneur, of a business owner. Um, and so I became fascinated with, with franchising and with what they were doing in particular. Uh, and so uh, rather than launch my own business, I essentially went into business with the cleaning authority, I went to work for the cleaning authority and franchise development. Uh, and then I, I got into it and I got to meet people like you and I got to meet people like all the franchisees that I had the pleasure of working with and, and placing. Um, and, uh, and, and I was hooked. And, and like you, like anybody in franchising, there was never a desire or path to be in franchising. We just somehow found our way. And then once you're there, like, wow, look at this. And that's what happened to me. So it was through the cleaning authority. Uh, and then I was with the cleaning authority for, for years, golly, for 16 or 17 years. Um, we, the management team of the cleaning authority, eventually formed a, a platform or a parent company called Authority Brands and started to acquire their franchisors. Um, and grew. And then after a couple of private equity flips, I exited, took some time off. And then uh, and then about eight months ago, nine months ago, 10 months ago, back at the, the uh, end of last year, I joined premium service brands. It really is like an industry of people helping people. And we find, like Eric said, you know, we franchising finds us. Stan Friedman interviewed me on his podcast, Franchising yeah. Today. And it was the first time I heard that the question asked in that way, but he said, Kim, how did franchising find yeah. you? And I'm like, it's the best question because it's like, it's the right yeah. question, right? So it's great. And we're just like the, the group of people that we've been together with for 20 years. We're so blessed. Yeah. I mean, we, we literally are like college yeah. friends, right? Like we've been friends just like as close. And, and so when we, when people talk to me about like, you know, how do you actually select your franchisors that you work with? It's like, it's not this like, you know, database of companies. It's, it's a, it's years of relationships with people like Eric Wexler, people that I know have integrity, people that I know have a heart to help other people. Like my matching process is more an art than it is a science. And a lot of that art centers around the relationships that I have and have nurtured and grown for 20 years with people like Mr. Wexler, which is why he's wow, here today. You. So now you're with premium service yeah. brands and you were lucky enough, let's not bypass that you were lucky enough to be mentored by a legend in franchising, Tim Ivankovich, the founder of the Cleaning Authority and Authority Brand. So that no, no doubt, like that definitely helped you. So now you're on this path with premium service brands. Tell us a little bit about who premium service brands are, like what brands you represent and the role that you're playing. Sure. Today. Thank you. Yeah. Um, premium service brands is very exciting. Uh, we have seven brands and we almost certainly will have an eighth and ninth brand here in, in coming months. Uh, they're all home service brands. Uh, brands such as, let's hope I don't miss any off the top of my head here, 360 Painting and Prolift Garage Doors and um, Rubbish Works, Junk Hauling and Dumpster Rental and Renew Crew, Exterior Hardscape Cleaning and Made Right, which is a, an industry I'm particularly passionate about and familiar with, residential cleaning. And um, uh, Kitchen Wise, which is uh, shelving and, and kitchen organization and other rooms and house closets and garages as well. Um, and Handyman Pro, and I think that's all seven of our brands. Um, and uh, what's what's wonderful about premium service brands and the reason I, I came out of, I guess it wasn't so much a re semi-retirement as it was a sabbatical in retrospect, um, was because of my excitement for premium service brands. It's when I started with the cleaning authority all those years ago, consumer revenue, we may have been doing 60 or 70 million in revenue. And when I left, the company had grown to a point of about one and a half billion dollars in consumer revenue. 
And the premium service brands is, is on the lower end, about 80, coming up on 90 million in consumer revenue, but already with seven smaller brands poised for tremendous growth. And so being a part of that growth again is, uh, is what has me excited. And, and, and like you said about the relationships and the inventory and, and the reason why you choose the franchisors that you represent, um, what we're doing is really profound, Kim. And I know you know that. And I know anybody in the industry knows that. Um, your listeners, depending on, I guess, their, their, their background and their experience in business ownership or even just investigating, they, they may not yet appreciate that we appreciate how profound a consideration it is becoming a business owner, becoming a franchise owner. And so recognizing that, we take it very seriously as a responsibility and not just representing any old brands, but and I know you as much as anybody are passionate about the 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 future, the success that your clients have in franchising, and 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 I feel very comfortable. I certainly experienced that with the cleaning authority and authority brands, and uh, no doubt the same is true for premium service brands. I'm in a referral based business, and I. I had people signing franchise agreement yesterday and was sort of doing my, you know, kissing them off on their wedding yeah. day call as I refer to this whole thing as a courtship leading to a marriage. And I said, look, you know, yes, technically I get paid to get you to this point in time, but I just, I don't want to just lead you to a yes. I want to help you live yeah. the life that you're saying yes to. So if you need the daily coach, you got to come yeah. back, right? And that's what we're here for. And you're lucky enough to be a part of that process after they yes. say yes to take them on. So when you when you look back over your tenure, you know, we oh, there's a lot of questions around why if franchising is such a good thing and systems are so strong and leadership is so good, then why do franchise businesses fail? So, you know, I, you know, we can talk about the standard answer. Well, franchisees don't follow the system or, but, but so in your yeah. words, in your experience, why do franchisees or franchises yeah. fail? Is it the franchise or is it the franchisee? Well, Let's start there. I mean, it can be either, certainly. Success in franchising and, and, and really to, to, to boil it down simply, and, and it's not simple, but it's, um, success is, Anything it's anything but simple. simple. It's certainly anything but easy. Sometimes it's simple in, in, in the fundamental components, kind of formulaically it's simple, but it's not simple or easy in execution and, and achieving success. Um, simple over here and easy. Yeah. Not necessarily the That's same. Right. And, and success, it's, yeah. success in franchising has to be, it has to be mutual. You, you can't have successful franchisees, but the franchisor is not successful. That's not sustainable. You can't have a successful franchisor, however you want to measure that, if franchisees aren't successful. That's not sustainable. So it's it, it's really about achieving that balance. Um, but to answer your question about why franchise franchisees or franchises fail, I would say mostly or as much as any other reason, it's because business ownership in general is just not right for everybody. Franchising or otherwise, and franchising has some particular attributes. Um, but business ownership in general is not right for everybody. And most people don't know whether they're going to be, whether they have the characteristics to be a, a good business owner. They may have achieved tremendous success in the corporate world. They may be highly educated with, you know, a, a top of their class MBA or, or whatever that might be. Um, but being, holding yourself accountable when there's not really anybody else, there's not a boss holding you accountable. There's not a board of directors holding you accountable. That takes a certain, a certain character trait, um, and and not everybody has that. Most people that we deal with, I know your clients for sure, and I know the franchisees that we ultimately uh, award franchises to, have had tremendous success in what they've done before, and that's one of the things that we measure, right? We want to know that they've been able to achieve success before, um, but that does not always translate. Um, and so, and, and it's difficult for us to know, to know on the front end. While we know that that's the case, we don't know that person well enough. It's one of the reasons we work so hard to get to know somebody, to try to help them figure that out. Um, one of the most important things that we can do, I know that, that I can do and that my team can do, is to help somebody be introspective. You know, I, I tell people all the time, um, the actual diligence through the discovery process is an intellectual pursuit. 
And most of our candidates and clients are, are comfortable with that intellectual pursuit. Um, and they're, they're, they're running the numbers and the oh, logical yes, data. Right. They oh, need to oh, know, oh. am I going to be <laughs> successful? And I need to map it out. Well, you can map it out based on the discovery process, which is of course very, uh, detailed and, and thorough process of, of due diligence, but you can't really know because you don't know how you're going to be. So having somebody, the, the intellectual pursuit is interesting and, and, and easier, relatively speaking. It's when somebody is done the intellectual pursuit and now they've got to make the decision and now they've got to be introspective and it's more emotional and less intellectual. That's the most difficult thing to help people through. And, and I know in, in a, a conversation prior to, to going on air here, you, we were having a discussion and we were talking about some examples of, of helping people get into business. And, and I have a lot of examples. I, I, I've had the fortune of helping many people, several hundred people get into business. And, and of course, hundreds and hundreds more that didn't make the decision to get into business or that, or that ultimately we decided mutually it wasn't a good fit. Um, but but there's one story that I think tells it all, and it's 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 almost fantastical, as true as it as it absolutely is. And this was a wonderful candidate, an MBA. She had a little bit of business ownership experience. This was a colleague of yours that that placed her 15, 16 years ago. Um, and during the diligence process, she was incredibly excited and everything, and it was all making sense to her and the residual income and the recurring revenue and the support that the franchisor provided. It was all wonderful to her. Then she got to the towards the end of the process and fear and anxiety, which is a real natural thing, crept in and she was going to pull away from the process. I'm not saying I don't want to do it, Eric. I'm just going to take a pause. And so her name is Laura. So I said, Laura, and, I, and I've said similar things, exact same thing to many people over the years. But Laura, do you want to be a business owner? She said, yes. So, OK, well, then I'm going to press you. If you told me no, then stay in the corporate world and, and, and achieve as much success as you can achieve there. But do you want to be a business owner? Yes. Okay. Well, then I'm going to press you uh, to become a business owner, to make the decision to move forward and to do it. And, and long story short, she did. What was fantastical about it was in our very first call, and I didn't remember this. She reminded me of this years later. I asked her conversationally, being interested, what do you want to do? If you achieve success, what does your future look like in an ideal uh, ideal scenario. She said, I want to live around the world. You mean you want to travel? No, I want to live around the world. Explain that to me. Well, I want to be able to go. I want to have a business where I can go and I can spend six months out of the year in Paris and then maybe come back and focus on my business and then spend six months in Tokyo and then back to Florida, where she is, and then six months in Vancouver. Wow, that's, a, that's amazing. I, I hope that you can achieve it. You know you'll never achieve that as a business owner. There's a possibility, certainly, you can achieve it. As, excuse me, and it, the opposite. You know you can achieve that as a business owner. You can't achieve that if, if you stay in the corporate world. Um, and so some years later, eight, nine years later, when she was being awarded Franchisee of the Year, this is when she reminded me of so much of this conversation. And she was saying she would have walked away. If I had said to her, okay, if I hadn't pressed her, um, she would have walked away. She would have stayed in a corporate job. And she was literally leaving from that conference where she was accepting the franchisee of the award and she was going to Paris for six months. Um, so there's somebody now her success was because she executed operationally. It wasn't because of the brilliance of the model, because we have people that fail in the same brilliant model. She executed and she told us all when she gave the speech and she reminded me in particular, she reminded herself whenever times got tough, which a daily basis as a business owner. Whenever times got tough, she reminded herself of her objective and reminded herself that she could not achieve that objective in any other path than business ownership. And she did. And that's, there are lots of other similar stories, but that's a brilliant one because living around, living in Paris for six months and then Tokyo for six months and what a lifestyle that is. That's amazing. And that's the power of franchising, but more, more important that's the power of having a clear, specific yes. why, which is what you just helped her to refocus on, right? So that's yep. the power there. We we so we can lead the people to great leadership teams who have great toolboxes to run a business and you know proven track records. 
but it's what the candidate does with that toolbox and that what they do is going to be motivated by why they're doing it. And so as you so brilliantly said, it's you can go about this process logically and of course we're going to do that. The numbers of a business have to make sense. The skill sets, all that has to make sense for the the candidate who's thinking about saying yes to this. But at the end of the day, the decision really, it hinders less on the numbers that you can figure out by looking at a franchise disclosure document or talking to owners and way more to do with your belief in yourself and your belief that you can connect these dots, that you have this vision of yourself in the future and you're kind of back ending you're into, okay, so if I say yes in this moment, I can have that future three, five, 10 years from now because I dared to say yes today if I stay the course yeah. and follow through. Yeah. So awesome. It's so true. It's what I what I preach here every day here on the daily and, coach. And you know, you had asked about the the kind of the opposite of that. And I'll put this out there. I've worked with, as you have too, many, many MBAs over the years. And certainly you don't need an MBA to be successful as a franchisee. Uh, not at all. In fact, some of the, uh, the MBAs may have, may become the the example I'm about to give. Um, very uh, well educated, successful corporate career MBA, and he went about his diligence as a school project, case study. You know, like he was back in school again, and um, and and he produced. And I remember precisely. I still have it probably somewhere in one of my files. An 84 page prospectus of graphs and charts and and this goes back 15 years too or you, you, you just he put a lot of effort into producing this and it was well bound and spiral and all that um and and his name was jim i said jim this is great but how are you going to interact with your customers how are you going to interact with your employees how are you going to interact with with the support mechanisms of a franchisor oh if you look at page 15 and you, and you look at the index on page 32 and you compare this is brilliant i'm going to keep this and i've kept it all these years but this isn't what's going to drive success for you. Your operational execution and your understanding and your focus on the fundamentals of the business is what's going to drive success for you. Um, and, and frankly, Kim, that franchisee failed. And he failed gloriously. And what I mean by that is he put together a board of he, he He overcomplicated it in such a way that he did not focus on the daily fundamentals of the business. And, uh, and and so just back around to you can build your business up to a place where you're managing it from a boardroom, so to speak. Um, but you've got to focus on the fundamentals and allow the franchisor to do what they do well. So there's kind of opposite end of the spectrum. And I don't recall ever hearing the real objective aside from I want to make money from Jim. Laura's objective, of course, included making money. You can't live in Paris for six months if you can't afford to. Um, but it was more than that. You know, I recently interviewed, I know you know the the brand uh, Paul Davis. I, I recently interviewed a former Wall Street, 20-year career on Wall Street, decided to leave uh, the financial world to start a restoration company because <laughs> right. that's totally logical. And uh, within four years, this guy was a global leader. And you can find this interview right here on uh, Kim Daily TV. Um, within four years, he, he built a company that is doing $21 million Maybe. a year in revenue. So it doesn't always have to take no. forever either to get back to those financial wins either. It is sometimes about the money, but it's more like for that gentleman, it was more about taking that global leadership skill that he had honed for 20 years working for somebody else and then applying it to a model that he could scale where he could, again, use that leadership. And at the time of our interview, he lives in Houston. He had just purchased Raleigh, oh. North Carolina as his first sort of off-site location because now he's thinking about going national. He's like, "All right, I I know how to manage people in other parts of the country in other parts of the world in my former career, so why is that any different in doing it for myself?" So, super super exciting interview. Definitely check that out if you're interested in learning more about that story. Yeah. So, Eric, back to you. So, now you've you, you've landed at premium service brands. So as this experienced franchise developer who clearly cares about re awarding licenses to the right people, and like you, like you said, I mean, 
what is the right person? I almost wanted to interrupt you and say, well, that kind of begs the question, you know, if someone's listening, how do I know if I'm the right person? And I'm going to answer it. You know, you're the right person when you have that burning desire in the pit of your stomach that says, I want to do this for myself. You have clear, specific goals that you write down that you, that you are not just like things that you put on a paper, but they're real in your heart that you want to bring to life and you cannot achieve those working for somebody else. That's what makes you the right person for franchising. That's what puts you on the path to becoming a rookie of the year or having a big business in a franchise and living your best life. It's not the people with an M- an MBA. It's not the people, only the people who went to Harvard or Princeton. It's the everyday people who have dreams, who can follow the lead of a proven franchisor. So Eric, you've had this great career. You've awarded in all these licenses to people, you've seen success, you've seen failure. So why have you chosen at this moment in time to partner up with Paul at Premium Service Brands? What is it about that opportunity that made you say, come out of your sabbatical and say, I'm ready to grow again? Um, I missed it. (laughs) I missed franchising. I missed helping people, setting people on the path. Because we yeah. really oh, do my what goodness. we do, don't we? It's, it's, yeah. it's addicting. What we do yeah, is so really addicting. Is. And, and yes. I missed it. And I missed it terribly. And so um, I was I was eager. I, I was fighting this battle with myself because I was enjoying this quasi-retirement and more time with family and friends and those things that I am passionate about. Um, but I also missed it. But specifically, what drew me back to Paul Flick and premium service brands was Paul's strategy and vision uh, toward providing a platform for franchisees to scale in what I thought was a far more sustainable and responsible way than how scale is most often or more often achieved in business ownership and in franchising. And plenty often, quite successfully, um, franchisees scale by adding more territory and and growing horizontally, if you will. Um, And that's a fantastic way to do it, whether it's within the same franchise organization or, or, or perhaps whether they, they buy, you know, an, another business, um, but scaling this way. And one of the challenges inherent, everything's got inherent challenges, of course, it, are the, the, the uh, logistical efforts to scale geographically. Um, and what Paul has designed very deliberately and very strategically and very effectively is the ability to scale up. We provide home services. And you know, back in the day when my primary focus uh, was residential cleaning, we heard all the time from franchisees. They have teams in the home providing this great service and this great relationship. But while they're there cleaning the house, there's a painting company or a junk removal company or a handyman business. And we could capture all that business. We already have the relationship. We've already incurred the cost of acquisition to get the customer. Um, but it's a difficult thing to really to really do unless the franchisor has built a platform to support that. And that's what premium service, simply put for this brief conversation, that's what premium service brands has done. So when a franchisee chooses to be, um, let's say a ProLift franchisee, they can certainly achieve tremendous success just within ProLift, even just within one territory. Territories are nice and large. Um, but they can stack on other brands and grow up and benefit from what they've already incurred as a cost of acquisition, benefit from the relationship that they've already built and provide more services in a vertical growth rather than a horizontal growth. Uh, Other companies that I've worked for and other companies that I'm familiar with have tried that. One of the challenges there with authority brands, for example, we were acquiring businesses for tens or even hundreds of millions of dollars. They were already mature, established businesses. It's hard to integrate it in the way you need to, to be able to scale vertically. Paul very deliberately is acquiring smaller brands. And so while some of our brands look small, well, that's such a small brand. Why would I want to invest and become a franchisee of a small brand? It's not proven yet. Premium service brands is proven. Premium service brands has coming quickly up on 300 franchisees. We've been a franchisor for 15 years. Um, Even though we bring in a newer brand, providing home service, the marketing and process of customer acquisition, the uh, 
operational execution and vendor relationships and HR management, the unit economics, all of those things are very similar, almost regardless of the widget. And so providing that support across those brands allows franchisees the opportunity to scale vertically. And that's what had me most excited. Does, did you hear that? It's just a whole new way to scale a business. That's awesome, Eric. I'm going to I'm going to end this conversation on that note. For those people who are interested in premium service brands and learning about any of the brands and then the opportunity to scale using the other brands. Why don't we have why don't we do this, Eric? Let's have those people leave a comment below or reach directly out to the Daily Coach. Give me the opportunity to get you prepared um, as I know that you'll need to be prepared in order to get into an active investigation of any of the premium service brands. I'll make sure that the territories are viable and open for the specific brands that we're where you want to start and maybe where you want to grow. And then we'll put you back in. Then I'll get you into the system with premium service brands. Does that make sense, Eric? Absolutely. Completely. Eric, I really, really appreciate your time today. I know that this has been um, really helpful to people just in understanding not just the daily coach talking about success and failure and that wealth is created through scale and scale can be this way, but now scale can be this way. My pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. And anybody that has the the, the opportunity to work with you is blessed to be able to work with you, whether for whether you present premium service brands or otherwise. So uh, whoever is listening to this, um, have a conversation with Kim for sure. That's awesome. You know what? I forgot to ask you my closing okay, question. Yeah. We can't forget that. All right. So the closing question on the Kim Daily TV is, um, <laughs> what is it? <laughs> yeah, I was all- I was so yeah, yeah. to just be like, see you later. Right. <laughs> so no. So people don't always right. remember what we say. And they don't typically yeah. even remember what we do. But they usually remember sure. how we make them feel. How do you, Eric Wexler, want to be remembered by your friends and colleagues in franchising, by all of the people that you've placed in the franchise industry. Since most people listening to this or probably everybody doesn't know me so well, maybe maybe this is true. Love. The word's love. I, I, I love what I do. I love helping people. I love helping people find what they love. Um, I love my friends. I love my family. It's uh it's it, it's it, it, it's really like my mantra of a word. I love love. And that's what I would share with people. All right, guys, on that note, too much love here on The Daily Coach. If I can do anything to help you pursue your dream to become a business owner through franchising, absolutely do not hesitate to reach out directly to The Daily Coach. Until next time, my name is Kim Daly, and I want to be your Daily Coach.